The Stax Bauer Sotheby sale of the D. Brent Pogue family collection was, without a doubt, one of the most thrilling events in numismatics that I ever experienced. The collection was historic. Every coin was among the finest, if not the finest, of the type, meticulously assembled over three decades, carefully curated by some of the best numismatic advisors in the industry. The presentation was impeccable. Stax Bowers really put on quite a show and the Sotheby's sales floor and display area really captured the specialness and exclusivity of the offering. And if I feel that way, as a member of the media, I can't imagine how the collectors and dealers felt as they raised their paddles or clicked the bid button on their computers. Overshadowed by the first Pogue session, but held a day after, was a 109 lot rarity sale. You'd be forgiven for missing it, as the offerings were clearly not of the same level and importance of the Pogue coins. In that sale, Stax Bowers offered a high condition census Was Molitor $50 slug and an NGC 63 holder, which I'm told by David McCarthy was downgraded to a PCGS 62 plus after the sale. An inverted Jenny stamp was among the holdings, a few Chinese rarities, a spray of high denomination banknotes, a beautiful high relief matte proof 1922 peace dollar, maybe the most beautiful peace dollar I've ever seen. That coin passed after failing to meet its opening price with an estimate of $250,000 to $350,000. And there were about 50 or so federal gold issues. If I were to guess, the side session was meant to attract new numismatic buyers. Maybe people who were attracted by the historic Pogue event and wanted more of a taste of what coin collecting was all about. The lot descriptions in the catalog were very basic, almost overviews of the type, and not the in-depth specific writing you would expect from a typical Rarities Night catalog. Suffice it to say that if you were someone who collects catalogs of important events, this sale would not be one of the most memorable in its class. There was one coin, however, that did stand out. It was a coin with an out-of-this-world story, and I will describe it next in the Coin Week podcast. The Coin Week podcast is brought to you by PCGS. To check out this quarter's grading specials, visit their website at www.pcgs.com. When astronauts Frank Borman and James A. Lovell Jr. of the Gemini 7 mission blasted off into low Earth orbit on December 4, 1965, they set out to achieve two primary things. One, to settle into low Earth orbit and stay there for 14 days, and two, to rendezvous with the Gemini 6A capsule. Smithsonian Institute curator Michael Neufeld once called the mission an endurance test. It was also a high-wire act for NASA, which was hurriedly preparing the launch of a second orbital vehicle while Gemini 7 orbited the Earth. Borman and Lovell's flight was significant, but... Amazingly, the pair may be better known for their participation in the Apollo program. The pair teamed up again with astronaut William Anders on Apollo 8. That was the flight where Anders took the breathtaking photograph of the Earth rising above the moon. Lovell would go to the moon, but famously have to turn back on board of Apollo 13. During the space flights of this period, official and unofficial souvenirs were often flown into space. According to ANA member Bob Millar, who has spent a career in the space industry, people would smuggle small items and place them in various nooks and crannies of the space capsule. Of course, getting caught would be a firing offense. It was also dangerous. If an object became loose in zero-g, it could come into contact with wiring, cables, or other components, which could have deadly consequences. But there are also sanctioned souvenirs. Astronauts had a small amount of personal space in the form of a personal preference kit, or PPK. Objects could be placed elsewhere as well. 
And that's where the story of that particular 1793 cent comes into play. It was owned in the mid-1960s by coin dealer William J. Ulrich Sr. of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Ulrich Sr. had managed to contact Howard A. Minners, a recovery surgeon at NASA, and got him to agree to take the coin into orbit. Minners placed the copper coin into the astronaut's medical kit, where it was tucked away among a row of yellow antibiotic tablets. For two weeks, the Gemini 7 capsule and its crew orbited the Earth conducting science experiments, doing maneuvers and experiencing the effects of prolonged exposure to zero-g. Ulrich's 1793 reef scent struck on a screw press, by hand, by Americans in a fledgling country that couldn't even begin to dream that future Americans would be carrying it into space, was also on board. On December 15, 1965, three days before the capsule returned from near-Earth orbit, Minners wrote to Ulrich on board of the American aircraft carrier, the USS Wasp. Minners wrote to Ulrich confirming what he'd done with the coin, writing, I hope you're enjoying the thought that right now your 1793 wreath scent is in orbit. I have flown aboard this carrier from Bermuda, and we eagerly await the astronauts return to Mother Earth. The coin is in their medical kit, and I shall try to photograph it in the kit before removal after the flight. A color photograph documenting this was taken by NASA on board the WASP approximately four hours after the Gemini spacecraft touched down on December 18th. A letter printed on NASA letterhead dated January 25, 1966, and signed by Borman, Lovell, and Minners corroborated the story that the coin was sent to orbit. A copy of the December 18 coin in the med kit photograph, archived in the NASA archives as photograph S6618180, was included in a letter sent to Ulrich from Minners dated March 9, 1966. For his part, Minners received nothing from Ulrich, doing it instead as part of a fairly routine public relations gesture. Americans at the time had gone space crazy. NASA astronauts were celebrated as national heroes, and the space program was a source of great pride throughout the country. People just wanted to touch something having to do with the space age. Upon receiving the coin back, Ulrich put it on display at a few banks in Minnesota. It soon went back into his private collection before William Steinberg purchased the coin for 15000 I reached out to William's son, Robert, to see if he remembered the coin, and he did, faintly. He remembered a photograph taken of him and his father in the coin, which appeared in the September 13, 1972 clipping from Coin World. The coin made its way around. The Sachs Bowers listing doesn't seem to know all the roads it traveled. It does note that Thomas V. Tallarico of Tallarico Rare Coins of Springfield, Massachusetts, negotiated a private treaty sale with an unnamed collector. Tallarico operated the business in Springfield for 10 years, from 1980 to 1990, and on February 17, 1987, he sold the coin to Paul Sims for $20,000. The coin's whereabouts after that are unpublished as well, although, you know, I assume Stax Bowers knew who the consigner was. Sims was an interesting character, a catalog dealer known to those who get Coin World or Numismatic News in their mailboxes. He operated a shop in Tuckahoe on the outskirts of Richmond, Virginia. Not an inviting place as far as coin shops go. It's set up more as a place for people who wish to sell off material that they inherited. I don't know why any serious collector would want to go there and get back a bid prices for choice material. When I got my start, Paul sat with me for an interview about coin grading. His company sold raw coins at various grades, including coins advertised as being choice uncirculated. He was old school, and his business model was more about shipping up pieces in quantity, quality not being the first priority as far as I could tell. Once they advertised Grant half dollars in Choice BU. I showed up unannounced to look at them, and after the security guard rang me in, I was given the opportunity to look at one or two pieces. They were both cleaned slidery coins, so I passed. Sometimes Paul was very gracious, and he welcomed me on one or two occasions to cherry-pick his mint sets for nice Ike dollars. On one trip, I bought a fresh roll of 1971 Ikes, 
That roll yielded a number of MS-65 coins and two coins graded MS-66. I paid $5 a coin for that deal. The day I bought that roll, Paul was running out of time, literally. He had late-stage cancer and was working like a dog to prepare his son to take over the business. I asked him if he would like me to write an article about the company's transition, about Paul's life in the business, and the challenges that lay ahead. He thought it might be a good idea, but that I'd have to do it soon because, as he put it, he wouldn't be around all that long. Fortunately, his son never followed up with the idea, and I learned that Paul passed through a thread on the PCGS forums. The company now does business as yesterday's change. As for the Ulriches, now they were an interesting pair. I wish I could find out more about them, but the people I've talked to, dealers and contemporaries, didn't have too much to offer. Pete Smith prepared a document for the Northwest Coin Club that contained short biographical sketches of a number of Minnesota coin dealers. That document painted an unflattering sketch of Ulrich and his son, William Ulrich Jr. Ulrich Sr. was a coin dealer affiliated with American Coin Company who abruptly left town for the Bahamas. That's usually not a good sign. His son's story was even worse. Ulrich the Younger was affiliated with a number of companies, including the aforementioned American Coin Company, later with Central Coin Exchange and Security Rare Coins and Bullion. It was Security Rare Coins that he found himself in real trouble, being charged by the FTC for fraudulently selling millions of dollars of coins at three and four times their value, while representing that they were low-risk, high-yield investments. In 1990, a circuit court ordered him to pay $11.2 million in damages to his customers. Ulrich appealed and then conspired to defraud the agency out of the judgment by moving his money around. He was handed a six-year prison sentence. Ulrich also operated a notorious hotel buyers group, one that gained some negative press for underpaying for coins and collectibles. It was during one of his buying trips in Florida that he was robbed and beaten. There were other allegations made against him as well. In preparing for this podcast, I made an effort to reach out to him to see if he remembered this coin, but the number posted on his website did not connect me to him, but instead to someone who hung up on me when I asked to talk to Bill. If coins are a totem, this coin's pedigree is a mix of good and bad. So what of the coin itself? Graded NGC Extra Fine 45, the coin is a Sheldon 9 in later die state. Diagonal cracks run through two areas of America to the wreath and stems on the coin's right side. It's reasonably well struck and not unattractive for the grade. The hammer price of $82,250 is quite high, as you can be assured to get an attractive choice egg you example for half that amount. Clearly, the space connection is what this coin has going for it. But space is just one part of the coin's story. We know nothing of its provenance before Bahama Bill Ulrich sent it up into space, and we know little about the collectors in between. The coin was transacted by a couple of dealers who made a couple of bucks selling a piece of American history. A numismatic tourist with a curious if not completely mercenary attachment to a more romantic period of American innovation. Perhaps the pedigree should read Space X Swindlers. Special thanks to Bob Millar for his help on the NASA portion of today's podcast. Bob is actively involved in efforts to support the Astronauts Memorial Foundation. Learn more about what this important organization is doing to support space education by visiting its website, www.amf.com. CSE.org.